Hello. <laughs> Kind of peeking in from the side to make sure the video is somewhat decent. Because it's gorgeous out here. Hello, everybody. Shalom, Jennifer, Patty, Dan, what's up, bro? What's up, Jennifer? Hey, Etel. Hey, Will. What's up, everyone? It's a gorgeous sunset. I'm going to try to avoid getting too close to this camera because Facebook hasn't quite perfected their, uh, their camera yet. But it's magnificent. What's up, Richie, Monty, Tammy? We're going to let people pile on for just a second. I'm just going to say a few words because right now, the spies of Israel, the ten spies, have left the camp of Israel in the desert and they've come into Israel and they're scoping the place out right now. And they're about to come back after 40 days with a negative report. Hey, Suzanne. And it's up to us to change that negative report every single day of our lives. Because we're still, sp every day we are told we are paying for the sin of the spies. So today we're going to watch sunset, we're going to say a little psalms, we're going to talk about Zionism, we're going to talk about this glorious land, and we're going to ask ourselves how we, all of us right now today, without any excuses, stand up for Israel and do something right now during this, I guess it's 39 days, while the spies, these 10 spies are in the land. Actually, there's 12 spies, right? There's one spy from each tribe. We call them spies. Who were the Maraglim? Who were these spies? They weren't Mossad agents. These were the Nasim. These were the, the princes, the presidents, the leaders, the rabbis of each tribe. And Moses, Moshe, sent them thinking that they would be the most responsible people that the tribes would listen to. He could trust them. These are men of great stature who have seen miracles happen before their eyes. But these are also men who have just come from hundreds of years of slavery in Egypt to where the Jewish nation reached the lowest level possible spiritually. One more minute at that level, God would have destroyed us. And it's at exactly that point that God rescued us from the land of Egypt. <clears throat> but we still have these men that are coming from hundreds of years of slavery. The lowest of the low as far as feeling who they are as a nation because they aren't one. They're slaves. And they're scared. These are men that have high status positions outside of the land of Israel. Take the grease out of your ears, rabbis of America. I love you. Your congregants love you. You need to be standing up on the pulpit every week telling them it's time to come home to watch this sunset or you are propagating the sin of the spies right now. Go ahead, call me a fanatic. But we are in a time of redemption. And you, as the leader of your tribe, no matter what city you may find yourself in the world, I, as an American, grown in America, I can speak to Americans. I can't speak to my European brothers and sisters as well. Because I don't understand them and their culture as well. But my American brothers and sisters, I get it. I understand that desire to have more, to live better, to have a bigger home, to plant your roots in your stepmother's land. But this is Ima, this is Bayit, this is Haaretz, and this is what the spies didn't want you to know. Because they feared. They lacked faith, they lacked truth, and they lacked leadership precisely at the wrong time. We could have avoided all of this misery 
since then. If only the leaders of our nation, these men that all of us looked up to at that time, if they would have just done what God commanded them to do. It wasn't that difficult as far as I'm concerned. Because I myself brought my family out of Egypt. I was born and raised in Memphis, Tennessee. Memphis is the name of a city in Egypt. All of y'all from Memphis know there's a pyramid right on the Mississippi River. Built by a Jew, by the way, as a sports stadium. I quite literally took my children on the wings of eagles. I ignored what those ten righteous men, those wonderful men who all of the tribes were following every day of their lives, asking them the questions, asking them for judgment, asking them for blessings. It turns out all of their blessings were for nothing. It turns out their judgments were evil. It turns out at the last minute when they were needed the most during crunch time, like right now, crunch time, they failed the nation of Israel. So, ask yourself the question. Are you following a winner or are you following a loser? Are you following somebody who's telling you they must keep their job on the pulpit so they need their congregation to stay outside of these borders? Or are you following somebody who is begging their congregants to pick up and move? Come home to this land. I'm not judging you for living outside of these borders. For 2,000 years, it was the right thing to do. There was a small remnant of our family here, alone cut off for thousands of years waiting for you to come home. And the sin of the spies, just like you drop a pebble in a lake and those little concentric rings reverberate throughout the water, so too throughout history, just like anything, this cell phone can project messages throughout the world. Invisibly, none of us can see the internet, yet we have put all of our faith in it with our work, with our stock trading, with our telephone calls, WhatsApp messages and videos. But we can't feel it, but we know it's there. So too, that can reverberate throughout history, just like a blessing that Jacob can give to his children and to the children of Joseph and to the children and the grandchildren of Israel. And that blessing reverberates throughout time. So too, the curses. So too, the sin of the spies. Now, when you're watching the sunset, which is just perfect. And it's right about done. The light's gone. The spies are on these hills right now, just like me. Undercover, not so much like me. I'm not very undercover. These guys are undercover. They don't want to get caught. And they're out on these hills looking and they're, they're looking at Hebron, which is 15 minutes from here. Hebron, the place of our patriarchs and matriarchs. And who went to Hebron? Kalev. Caleb. You know why Caleb went to Hebron? Because he was brave. You know why he was brave? Not because he had muscles or a gun. He didn't. Because he had a heart and a soul for God. And God told him, and God told those men, that you will enter that land. You will conquer that land. And that land will be yours and your inheritance forever. And Caleb, Caleb said, Heck yeah, I'm on board. To the point where he had to stand up and protect the leaders of Israel against a riotous mob who shouted him down when the, sla when the spies came back and told their tales of giants and massive fruits and fortifications that there's no way we little ants of humans, we slaves, we're dirt. How can we conquer giants? Go ahead and tell that to the men and women who drained the swamps here in the 1800s. Go ahead and tell that to the men and women who charged these hills with rifles in their hands against multiple Arab nations in the 1940s, 50s, 60s, 70s. Go ahead and tell them it can't be done. It took the most righteous of men in Israel to fail for all of us to learn a lesson. And the lesson is very simple. God, the Lord, Hashem, whatever name you have for God, couldn't be more clear 
in his statement that this land that he created, that belongs to him physically, he has given this to us physically and spiritually. It isn't temporary. It isn't a maybe. It is ours. It is always ours. The question is, when we're on it and off it, like a chart for a stock, sometimes the stock's doing great, sometimes it's in the dumps. Sometimes we're here, sometimes we get kicked off. But it's always ours. It's always our inheritance. It's like a present and it's just waiting for its owner to come and unwrap it. But are you worthy enough to unwrap your gift? And what does it take to be worthy? As King Solomon said, the basis of everything is fear of heaven, fear of godliness. It doesn't mean you stand and you quake in front of God all day. God didn't create us to be worms. God didn't create us to be slaves to him. God created us, at least us I know, humanity, to try to elevate the base into the holy, to try to create everything that God gave us and take it into something beautiful, into making, instead of making it into something that is completely dark and chaotic. And it's amazing how you can look at so many parts of the world right now and all you see is darkness and chaos. In nations that have plenty of money, plenty of oil, plenty of opportunity, chaos, darkness, cults of death. And then you look to America and you see chaos and darkness and people desiring more and more chaos, fighting against another 150 million who don't want that, who want to live life as Americans, who want to have good spiritual lives, who want to raise their children. There's this constant fight right now between good and evil. It's palpable. You can touch it. You can see it just like this beautiful sunset. But why should the world like Israel? Let me ask y'all a question. Let me get nice and close and personal. Why should the world care about us? Besides, he who blesses shall be blessed. Our own people throw Israel under the bus. Our own people assimilate out of Judaism as if it's a plague. The majority of American Jewish youth are gone, completely gone. They've cut off their royal lineage. The DNA of kings and queens that have built temples to God, that have gone through holocausts. Why? Not because there's something wrong with us, but because there's something wrong with people with humanity, and that darkness requires light. But it's difficult to go after that light. It's much easier to cut it off and go away and say, I want to be like everybody else. <coughs> this burden of Judaism is a burden. It's a yoke. It's a weight you carry on you. It's this guilt they laugh about, Jewish guilt. It's not funny. We're not guilty because we've done something wrong. We feel guilty because we haven't done enough right. You've got to understand the difference. Even right now, we're going to talk about it as King David wrote about it. In Psalms, Tehillim, chapter 91, He who dwells, he who dwells in the covert of the Most High will lodge in the shadow of the Almighty. I shall say of the Lord that he is my shelter and my fortress, my God in whom I trust. For he will save you from the snare that entraps, from the devastating pestilence. With his wing, he will cover you, and under his wing, you will take refuge. His truth is an encompassing shield. It's everywhere. The truth of God isn't the faith of God. Just because you don't have faith in God, does that mean God doesn't exist? I don't really believe in God, so... No, it just means you lack a certain connection to godliness because you haven't developed that. You haven't worked on it. 
What do you think? The greatest gift in the world is just going to be handed to you? Is your income handed to you? That's a curse! That you will have to work by the sweat of the brow is a curse! Is it handed to you? Is love between spouses handed to you? No, you work on it. You strive. You cry. You hug. You fight. You scream. But at the end, at the end, if you're right, and if you're righteous, you learn to release and give and take. You will not fear the fright of the night, the arrow that flies by day. Pestilence that prowls in darkness, destruction that ravages at noon. These are all demons. That they say spiritual demons that attack you throughout the day. Tell me we don't have that. Tell me you're not going throughout the day and you're doing really well. And you're walking a godly path, which I'm realizing more and more in my life. It's really simple, guys. It's so simple. The more you surround yourself with a godly path, the more you surround yourself with Torah, the more you surround yourself with God's word, the more you surround yourself with the words of King David and King Solomon and the prophets, the less desire you're going to want to go out and do something you're not supposed to be doing. Meaning, you're creating a shield for yourself. It's all encompassing. They're saying it right here. It doesn't mean God's coming to hug you. Come on, grow up. This isn't some fairy tale that's got some cartoons written into it. It's that if you are walking in that righteous path, if I am screaming out to God, please, I'm not asking you for the lottery. I'm not asking you for foolishness. I'm asking you for the same that the king of Israel asked you, for the same that his son asked you, the, king, the, the, the other king of Israel, Solomon. Simply light up my path with your light. And I can't go wrong. Because if that's the case, I will not fear the fright of the night. I will not fear the arrow that flies by day. Because who controls life and who controls death? It isn't the arrow. It isn't the archer. It is the creator with a capital C. You just have to knock that into your head. Not once a week at church or synagogue or whatever at mosque. It's every day. Which is why within Judaism it's so beautiful. There's so many fences around our commandments. And it took me 42 years or whatever, 43 at this point, to understand it. You have to put these fences around yourself. You have to put barriers. You can't just walk out and say everything is free to be. I can do what I want when I want. That's chaos. That ain't freedom, folks. Freedom is following a certain set of guidelines that allow you to find fulfillment and do goodness and have growth in this world, especially when it's bookmarked with godliness on both sides. That's real freedom because you haven't locked yourself in chaos. Look at this insanity that America has become in Seattle, this ridiculous, what is it, Chaz or Chop? Just call it chaos. And look what's going on there where they expected freedom in La La Land and everything's beautiful. It's insanity. It's like animals. And that's making animals look bad. It's because people have lost their compass, their way. Well, let me tell you, it's real simple. Look into the light. Just follow the light. <coughs> and when you feel like you're following the darkness, Stop yourself. That's it. It doesn't get too much more simple than that. We make it more difficult because we're stubborn mules. <coughs> Pestilence that prowls in darkness. Sorry, I've lost my voice this week. Destruction that ravages at noon. A thousand will be stationed at your side. And ten thousand at your right hand but will not approach you. A thousand right here. Ten thousand right here. And I can just sit here and be still. You know why? Yes, you do. Yes, you do. But now you have to take that reason for knowing why and spread it to those that are on the fence. Not to drag them into our camp because misery loves company. 
Not at all. Because by not showing people the glory of how beautiful life can be within certain godly boundaries, you are simply keeping that glorious light for yourself. And that's just plain rude. Which is why a smile can change somebody's entire day. Which is why, and I can tell you personally, from a convention I went to in America, an amazing man, young man, told the whole crowd on Sunday after coming up. He told the whole crowd. He said, guys, I want you to know, it was an all men's convention. He said, I want you to know, I brought a gun to this convention, and it was up in my hotel room. And I'm miserable, or at least I was. This is, this is, this is, this is real. And he said, if I didn't get from this convention this weekend, this brotherhood, this love, this godliness, but real, not the bullshit that I've been fed in church, not the crap that I've been sold, not the fear, godliness and love. If I didn't really receive that, that brotherhood this weekend, I was going to blow my brains out upstairs. But because of you, because of this crowd and this godliness and the reality that I've seen within, that's not happening. Do you understand what a smile can do? Do you understand what a hug to your brother and sister can do? And when I say brother and sister, I don't mean just family. I mean your neighbor. I mean your friends. I mean those that you think are your friends. <laughs> you will but gaze with your eyes, and you will see the annihilation of the wicked. The complete destruction of the wicked. All you got to do is look. For you said, the Lord is my refuge. That's it. They're not telling you you got to jump through hoops. You don't got to send off your mortgage check to this, this uh, televangelist so he can save you. Are you kidding me? What a scam. God is waiting for you. You don't need an intermediary. You don't need a rabbi. You don't need a priest. You don't need a anybody. All you need is to open your heart and soul to God. Your creator, your father with a capital F. All you have to say and believe and feel is the Lord is my refuge. And then you will watch the wicked get annihilated before your eyes. Those are some powerful words. No harm will befall you, nor will a plague draw near your tent. None of us want this plague near our tent. For he, God, will command his angels on your behalf to guard you in all your ways. On their hands they will bear you, lest your foot stumble on a stone. What a glorious Father we have. What a glorious God. Saying, my angels will literally lift you up. Because God forbid, you should, you should even stumble on this stone. Uh-uh. No. For those that follow my path, for those that say the Lord is my refuge, I will hold you in my hands. Al shachal v'peten tidroch tirmos Fear v'tanin On a young lion and a cobra, you will tread. You will trample the young lion and the serpent. <laughs> I mean, it's like telling us, no matter what your greatest fear is, whether it's the night, whether it's the arrows, whether it's the lion, the, the strength of something that's stronger than you that can rip you to pieces without even thinking twice, or whether it's the serpent that's silent and deadly that can smack your, your, your heel with its fangs and kill you within minutes. Don't worry about a thing. You know why? Because you're my child. And I'm God. And I'm not going to let anything happen to you. What other comfort do you need? He will call me and I shall answer him. I am with him in distress. I shall rescue him, and I shall honor him. He will call me. So first we're calling out, God, where are you? I need you. And I shall answer him. 
I am with him in his distress. You're not alone. And then, after all that, if that's not enough, I shall rescue him. And if that's not enough, I shall honor him. Wow. Are you worthy of that? Am I? Who are we to think we are worthy that God, the creator of everything, will not only answer us, not only will be our partner in distress, not only will scoop us up and rescue us, then God will honor us. Why? Because we honored God. Everything is the exact reciprocity of what we do. Every action has an equal and opposite reaction. Physically, so too spiritually. Almost done. With length of days I shall satiate him. And I shall show him my salvation. I'm just going to end here because it's getting dark. But right now the spies are in the land. Right now those ten princes of Israel are in this land. There's two out of those twelve. There's two out of those, I'm sorry, let me back up. There's twelve spies in this land. Out of those twelve, ten of them are about to cause the Jewish nation so much distress that it's going to last us. Not only make us wander what should have been a three-day journey into Israel, a 40-year journey where our, the entire generation that existed during that time had to die off. Why? So those that were born in the desert, those that were born on the hands of God, those that were born in pure truth, not faith, truth, because they witnessed it in front of their eyes, those were the ones that were righteous enough to take over the land of Israel. And what God is teaching all of us right now, including Stephen Klish, who just got on, who's an awesome guy, all of us. And Steve will say the same thing as I do. Who the hell is he? Who the hell am I to stand where Moses couldn't? Guess who we are? We're the nation of Israel. We are the culmination of thousands of years of DNA. Pushing us so hard that it's stronger than any tsunami that you can possibly imagine physically. Pushing us, pushing us every day. Deeper and deeper into this land farther and farther into the corners of this land to settle these hills, to take over the Golan, to make the desert bloom, to show the world that we Jews are not standing down. Uh-uh. No way. We are rising up once again like the phoenix from the ashes. And let me tell you, you can say and use that statement a lot, but there is no nation in the world that can say in modern history they truly represent that. How can you explain the Jewish nation? How can you explain a people that went from the gas chambers, the crematoriums? How can you explain a people who have been divided and destroyed on so many continents and on so many lands and under so many rulers you can't even count them? How can you explain a people that after all that have come back home by the millions to watch their homeland grow in ways they couldn't imagine, to grow in ways that can't be described on a physical sense. How can you explain us? And if you can't explain us, you either join us, praise us, fear us, or kill us. I'm hoping you choose the first set of options. But to all of you who try the second set of options, understand very clearly just like that sun sets and it will rise again from the east over Jerusalem. My brothers and my sisters are standing 24 seven, making certain that your hatred and your evil will not enter our homes. We have hundreds of thousands of young men and women learning Torah every single day, making certain that your evil will not cross our borders. And if you don't believe us, simply look at history. Stop being a fool. Open your eyes, Jewish nation. Repent, repent, repent for the sin of our great 
great, 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 great grandparents who failed us. Now is our turn to shine. Now is our turn to bring this redemption in. But we have a choice. We can either do it the hard way or the easy way. And the only way to do it the easy way is by healing yourself, healing your anger, healing your hatred, healing your ego, healing your physical desires and needs, healing yourself, slapping a big ass band-aid on it and saying I'm done. I'm gonna follow a path even if it kills me because I'm done. Why do you think in the big book, the good, whatever, the 12 steps for Alcoholics Anonymous, the first thing is that you gotta admit, you have to realize you have a problem, then you have to admit that there's a higher power out there, there's something controlling this. Why? What is it teaching you? It's teaching you that you can't do this alone. Nor do you have to. There's millions of righteous people out there. All you have to do is search them out instead of looking for darkness. And when you find them, latch on to them. And if they're real, you'll know it. And if they're not, discard them as if they're on fire and get rid of them. And then you'll find that little special forces team that speaks to you. And that helps you along that path. But I swear on everything. I swear, I, just like you guys, I pay my bills. I worry about things, I've got kids, I've got every responsibility you do. But I swear to God on the hills of Judea right here, if I had a Torah in my hand, I'd swear on the Torah in front of you all as my witnesses, with God as my witness, with these hills as my witness. The magnificence and the beauty and the righteousness and the truth that, uh, of the path that we are on is so pure that every single chance that darkness and chaos has to kick you in the head and tell you to stop, it's going to do it. Not once a week, not once a month, not once a year, not one big event in your life. Every single day from the time you get up to the time you go back to sleep, it's going to attack you because that's its job. Its job is to prevent you from excavating and digging and crying and tearing apart the truth so you can just see a little ray of light because it is darkness and that is its function. Just like a toaster oven will burn your bread if you leave it in for too long. Stop blaming the oven. Start taking responsibility for every action because God only wants us to be an Am Kadosh to yeah? Be a holy nation. Don't be a nation of accountants. Don't be a nation of doctors. If, don't be a nation of, of lawyers. Don't be a nation of sports guys. That's not what God is asking of us. Don't be a nation of soldiers. Nope, sometimes that's needed. What does God need from us? Am Kadosh. To be a holy, righteous nation. 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 That's not individual. That's not Instagram. Look at me. It's us. Look at us. What I do. If I stab myself here, it's going to affect the rest of my body. Just because I stab myself in the heart, my leg doesn't get away from it. My arm doesn't run away and say, hey, luckily it wasn't me that got stabbed. We are one body. That beating heart that you feel, that's your nation. That's your DNA. That's your spirit. That's your nephesh calling you from thousands of years. It's like an echo chamber. Latch on to it. Don't ignore it. And come home. Come home to where you belong. Tell those spies, tell those 10 supposedly righteous men who failed you. Tell them that you will do better than them. Tell them that you are better than them. No matter if you are Jewish, Christian, Muslim, whatever you might be right now, Tell those spies that you are better than them, that you will stand in front of Moses, that you will not represent the, the congregation of Korach, who tried once again to split the nation because of ego and lack of truth and belief in reality of what's going on around him. <coughs> 
And the, the land opened up and swallowed him alive, him and his whole congregation. Don't be like Korah. Don't be like those ten spies. Be like Caleb. Be like Kalev. Be the man that, even though he knows there's giants in Hebron, he goes. Why does he go? Because his parents are there. Abraham, Isaac, Jacob. Rebecca, Leah, Sarah. He went to go pray to his grandparents and no giant in the world would stop him. Just like when the whole nation of Israel was there with their army and the other army was standing across from them in a valley somewhere very close to where I'm standing. And they said, come on, Israel. We have Goliath. We have Goliath. Look at him. Who can beat this? Who can possibly crush this giant? He destroys everything in his path. It wasn't the mightiest of men from the nation of Israel that went forward. It wasn't the greatest muscles. It wasn't the biggest sword and spear. It wasn't the wealthiest businessman or woman. It was the little runt David who was always cast aside by his brothers and family. He was always on his side in the fields. But the little man David was practicing warfare. That little poet that would sing his beautiful words to God right here, right here where I stand. If you walked upon him, if, if you walked upon him, you would look at him and laugh, look at you with your, with your harp, singing songs, what are you? You're a little five foot nothing. They laugh at him. Woe to those who laugh at David. Woe unto the Goliaths that think that due to their great might and physical prowess and ability and battle and strength and kill list that they can laugh at a David. For little do they know that little David walks up with his slingshot, looks at Goliath and says, God is with me. What else do I need? The next thing we see, Goliath's head is in David's hand. Nobody's laughing at David anymore, are they? It's a, take it as a parable. Take it as something physical. But understand, we all have that ability to be that David. David wasn't a superhero. David was just another guy within the nation. But because of his godliness and because of his care for others and for his care for his flock, God chose him to lead the way. You don't have to look in the mirror and see a supermodel to think you're beautiful. You don't have to look in the mirror and see an Olympian or a, or a Navy SEAL to see a David. For I promise you, you, Mr. Whoever you are watching this, you, Mrs. or Miss Whoever you are watching this, one day you will also be called upon to be a David, to stand up in the face of a Goliath. And that day might be right now. You might be going through it right now. But either way, realize, nothing can stop you. I swear. I'm living proof. How, how am I standing on the highest hilltops in Judea? Coming from redneck Memphis, Tennessee. <laughs> nothing can stop us. I'm Kadosh. God bless you all from Israel. Look at that glory. We are all God's children. All of us. Not just Jews. All of us are God's children. All of us have responsibility. All of us have to raise ourselves from the mundane to the holy. All of us. Every day. Every hour. Every bite we take. Every breath. Everything we look at. Every way we talk to our family and spouse. Everything. Life is a test. We don't know how many breaths we have left. But what we do know is that we can take the breath we have right this minute, the heartbeat we have right this second, and bring out the light within it and spread it to the world. God bless you all from beautiful Israel. I have no idea if you can see the moon as well as I can. But the moon is up there. There it is. 
somewhere. It's really beautiful out right now. Anyways, you've all listened to me talk for way too long, and I am going to go home. Much love from this gorgeous land. And if the spies can hear me, Goldstein's here! <laughs> You're not getting away with your lies this time! And they can hear me. They know they screwed up. They're still paying for it thousands of years later. Let's, let's, let's help them. Maybe they made one lapse in judgment. Let's do what we can to help even those from the past. Let's try to rectify and correct their errors. So those sins aren't revisited upon our children. It's up to us to change that. God bless you all from Israel. Lila Tov. Much love.